It's Monday. It's April 11th. And the word of the day is komorebi, which is a Japanese word that means sunlight filtering through the trees. Used in a sentence, if you do the right drugs, you can taste the komorebi. <laughs> well, and if you take enough of them, you can be the komorebi. Okay. Is this a concept we needed a single word for? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yes. amazing. All right. <laughs> I'm no illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick. I'm Heath Enright. And broadcasting delayed from America's Far Center, we are the Skeptocrats. On this week's episode, Katanji Brown Jackson is confirmed to the Supreme Court. Ah, normally we do jokes. Donald Trump Jr. all but texts, <laughs> let's criminally crime crimes to Mark Meadows. <laughs> he does. And being a Republican means arguing that fig newtons are moist and wonderful and better than <laughs> Oreos. <laughs> but first, the rest of the intro music. Joining me for headlines tonight are my fellow skeptic rats, No Illusions, and Eli Bosnick. Gentlemen, we're all going to see each other in person soon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You excited about the ATL? We're going to Hotlanta. Oh, right? yeah. If bar trivia doesn't end in bloodshed, I will be sorely disappointed. <laughs> Dude, you're you're going to play board games with me, and you're worried about the bloodshed from trivia? <laughs> Fair point. Fair There's point. going to be blood just flying yeah. everywhere, there both sides of the, the arena or wherever we are. In our lead story tonight. Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Oh, Ooh, sounds good. That's the whole sentence. Mm -hmm. KBJ is in. I love it. We have an amazing new member of the nation's highest court starting this summer. Just a quick review. She's really good at everything she's ever done, ever, ever, ever. From scholar to clerking for prominent judges, including Stephen Breyer, who she's placing to private legal practice to public defender to federal judge amazing at everything and she's the first black woman on the supreme court in all of american history can we get a few more ooh oohs please <laughs> just, a, just a whole ooh, chorus ooh, ooh, okay ooh. now you're reading the white house's tweets though Heath, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well and, and while it's not chief amongst her qualifications she's also really good at eating ted cruz's fucking lunch and then asking him if he wants some <laughs> right as she starts on the last french fry <laughs> yep and that's pretty fucking cool. I like too. that. I enjoy that as well. Yeah. So much that energy when she did that oh. <laughs> with Cruz in the hearing. It's the best. So this is great news. And we should all revel in the moment. Just really soak it in. And happiness over. Welcome to the show. Yeah. <laughs> Everything else about the Supreme Court is terrible news. Every piece of context to what we've been talking about. Every detail of the confirmation hearings. Everything they're literally doing right now at this very moment is hot garbage. In one case, it's literal hot garbage. Oh, it is, yeah. <laughs> Pin in that. We will circle back. So I'll start by mentioning the vote total in the Senate. All the amazing credentials that Jackson brought to the table got her confirmed by a vote of 53 to 47. That's three votes better than the accused sex criminal on the court right yep. now. Mm-hmm. So, okay, sorry, that, that might have been big. Brett Kavanaugh. <laughs> yeah. about. He got confirmed 50 to 48. He had a not raping calendar to refute the allegation. Yeah. Cried. Remember a him not crying? not raping. Cried a lot. Wept. Likes beer. Ridiculous. So despite KBJ being the exact amazing opposite of Brett Kavanaugh in like every way, which basically describes like the platonic form of goodness, <laughs> <Yeah>. despite, mm -hmm. <laughs> despite being the platonic virtue of virtue, the only Republican senators to vote in her favor were Susan Collins, Mitt Romney, and Lisa Murkowski. Those are the voices of reason in the Republican <laughs> Party right now. A Mormon, almost billionaire hedge fund guy and two women who were already getting primaried for being two women yeah. in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And also for this now. They're, yeah. I'm sure going to be primary. Yeah. Collins and Murkowski are like the girl who bullied you all through high school, writing you a really long, really nice note in your yearbooks in the hopes that you won't remember them as an asshole. And it's not working, <laughs> by the way. It's not working. Yeah. And Mitt Romney is like the guy that bullied you in high school and that he literally bullied people in high school. Yeah. Yeah. Also his That's dog when he was in his 60s. That's yep. a different thing. But yeah. Yikes. Yeah. Read about that if you haven't. So. Last time around, we talked about the absurd farce that happened during the confirmation hearings when 
Ketanji Brown Jackson had to deal with a bunch of Nazi bridge trolls and their riddles three during the fucking hearings. <laughs> and she basically responded, no, I will not. Also, that's not a riddle. Also, you're dumb. Like each time she got one of these non riddles from these idiots. And that was fun to watch. But it was still offensive that she even had to deal with any of that at all and respond. Well, the ignorance and disrespect kept going at the final vote hearing. Rand Paul showed up late, pink eye or something, punched in the face by his neighbor. I don't know, something like that. Oh, he was late. Lindsey Graham didn't wear a tie, so they wouldn't let him inside the chamber. And he cast his bigot no vote from the coat room, apparently. I mean, obviously, the rule about wearing a tie is dumb. I didn't know about that. And, of course, extra fabric around the neck area could be a big safety hazard for someone with that much blood in his face at all mm -hmm. times. So that could be dangerous for Lindsey Graham. But I've never heard about him having this issue before at any other Senate thing ever with the tie. No. Nope. It's weird. And then just to be extra, extra disgusting, at the end of the proceeding, when Kamala Harris announced the confirmation and Jackson got a very much deserved ovation, a bunch of Republicans, including Ted Cruz, immediately got up and stomped out of the chamber in a goddamn snit. They did. Maybe he was going to Cancun. <laughs> yeah. And look, don't get me wrong, that's definitely bad and dishonorable, like, in the context of history. But on the plus side, the fact that the most they could do was leave early like your bitter ex who you spite invited to your wedding <laughs> is pretty fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of Republicans be like, boom, run, run. <laughs> so, again, super happy about KBJ, but the future of the court is horrible. She's going to spend most, if not all, of her SCOTUS career dealing with a majority block of conservative goddamn ghouls at every moment. In the words of professional law-talking guy and professional dick joke wrangler, it depends which order you do. You could say either one first. Andrew Torres said, Welcome to the court, Katanji Brown Jackson. We look forward to reading your incredibly intelligent dissenting opinions for yeah. the next few decades. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> And by the way, if you play uh, that backwards, what he just said, if you play it backwards in, in slow-mo, it says, you should have voted for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but if you play it sideways, it plays the far more useful home address of Brett Kavanaugh. So, you know, everybody wins. <laughs> Try it out. And uh, that brings us to the pin from before. This, it's the worst. Last week, the Supreme Court's conservative majority was able to reinstate a Trump era regulation that allowed more polluters to dump more pollution into rivers. Literal hot garbage. Wasn't joking about that. The Trump administration's EPA made a rule that prevented individual states from blocking potential polluters. We had a regulation that said you have to deregulate the clean water concept. Well, the Biden EPA decided that's fucking dumb mm -hmm. and went about changing the rule. And after a few court thingies, a federal judge out of San Francisco effectively made the new Biden rule into the law nationwide. Right. To be fair, if your administration was like canonically described as a dumpster fire for years, regulation on dumping can feel like a direct attack. Uh, That's sure. fair. I get it. And, and, and it was. That's yeah. fair. So, but sorry, <laughs> just zooming out for a second. Mm -hmm. The other side is against clean rivers. <laughs> <laughs> really? How the fuck do we still need debates and shit? We don't. We don't. It's just evil versus good. It's so... Mm, okay. So in response to any attempt at maybe allowing environmental protection, the oil and gas industry of specifically Louisiana, in this case, decided to file a lawsuit. They claimed the lack of a federal regulation that says you have to let us pollute stuff. That's unconstitutional to them. And they took it to federal appeals court and eventually the Supreme Court. And using the emergency docket, also known as the shadow docket, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court granted emergency injunctive relief to the oil and gas industry. <laughs> and they did that without any actual arguments being presented because that's how the shadow docket works. Right. Now, in order to get that type of emergency relief, there's supposed to be a threat of irreparable harm to justify the emergency order. For example, I don't know what would be like really bad irreparable harm pollution in a river there, there you go, go. Can't that would be an example. Yeah. and somehow this worked exactly backwards and the court granted emergency relief to the polluters for the irreparable harm in quotes of maybe not being allowed to pollute state by state well yep yeah, but well because the stuff that they dump in those rivers is dangerous and they'd have to otherwise keep it 
you know, around themselves. <laughs> no, I get it. It's that's terrifying. Yeah. Sure, yeah. And also, to be fair, the oil and gas company submitted a picture of a duck that was like very smug about how alive it was. <laughs> at the time. You're very honestly. You're you're making a joke, but I think that's actually more than they had to submit for this to happen. Oh, I'm sure. Yep. No, there was no. There was nothing. Yeah, it's right. the emergency yeah. docket. They didn't submit shit. And it's worth noting that Elena Kagan wrote a blistering dissent explaining that what the fuck is wrong with you people? That's backwards. Did you not hear yourself say everything backwards? And she explained how this is a textbook example of abusing the emergency docket. And for the first time ever, this is like good and bad at the same time, kind of for the first time ever, after a whole bunch of conservative justices abusing the emergency docket recently, we actually got Chief Justice John Roberts joining the liberal dissent about that sort of emergency docket abuse happening. Yeah. John Roberts is the voice of reason on the Supreme Court. We just mentioned what the senators were in the GOP. Now John Roberts, voice of reason in the Supreme Court. In order to lose five to four, we need the progressive liberalism of John fucking Roberts to shine yeah. through. Fuck. Yeah. All right. Good times. On that note, <laughs> I think we could all use some help. So <laughs> let's pause for a quick break for a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. It, uh, put it in some peanut butter. He just eats it and spits it out. It doesn't wow, work. Wow, wow, really? Yeah. Hey, guys. Gaw, what's, uh, you know, going on or whatever? Uh, hey, Eli. Is that a new outfit? You look like Larry the Cable Guy starring in a reboot of The Crow. Yep. Yeah, you know. It's not great. I just figured I needed a look to match my doomed outlook of the world because I'm so dark and brooding, you know? That's just who I am, you know? Dark, negative, and brooding. You know, Eli, a pessimistic outlook and withdrawal from the people that you love can actually be a sign of mental illness. You know that, right? You mean I might not just see the world in the stark light of reality that nobody else sees because they're sheep afraid of the truth? No, no, but you you definitely sound like you could use a little therapy, I'm just saying. Therapy? For me? What do I look like, a New Yorker cartoon from 2003? Well, I mean, a little. I mean, more far side, yes, I would say. Yes, definitely. But right? Eli, therapy is for everyone. That's why there's BetterHelp. What's BetterHelp? BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's affordable and financial aid is available. Plus, Skeptocrat listeners get 10% off the first month at BetterHelp.com slash Skeptocrat. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash Skeptocrat. Oh, all right. Well, can I keep this outfit for the chicks? Uh, sure, man. Is your chain wallet attached to, to your belly? Yeah. And we're back. Next up in insurrectile dysfunction news, CNN reported last <laughs> Thursday on a previously unknown text message sent from Donald Trump Jr. to Trump's then chief of staff, Mark Meadows, two days after the 2020 election, in which Jr. outlined the strategy for overturning the result that was later pursued by Trump's legal team. And following the summary of illegal sovereign citizen level ideas that he heard about on InfoWars, he pointed out, quote, we have multiple paths and we control them all, end quote. <laughs> Try to snatch this. Fuck. Oh, OK. Well, I wasn't ready. <laughs> <laughs> Now, try to say, damn, it. wait until I'm going to do a one, two, okay. three, yeah. go. Yeah. Got it again. Then you, oh. I now, have you in a wrist lock. <laughs> the, the strategies Junior laid out in the text were not his own ideas. I, I mean, it's almost overstating the case to classify them as ideas at all. It's all the dumb shit that Rudy <laughs> Giuliani and his crack team of Krakens got disbarred over. Right. Yeah. So it's stuff like demanding recounts to delay certification beyond ceremonial dates that he seemed to think were magical and <laughs> pressuring state legislators <laughs> to put forward fake Trump friendly electors. Okay. That's real. They really thought there was like a magical deadline yeah, situation right. happening. Like, ha ha, midnight. Biden's a pumpkin and you can't elect a pumpkin. <laughs> and I have one. Like that. That's right, what they yep. were going for. Yes. I don't think Trump would have wanted you can't elect a pumpkin out there as a well, rule. Yes, no, actually, yes. <laughs> Very good point. All right. So but uh, then 
In an act bordering on the attempted murder of irony, Trump Jr. added, quote, We have operational control, total leverage, and the moral high ground. POTUS really? must start second term now, end quote. Now, and keep in mind, this was two days after the election before a victor had even been declared. Yeah. And hey, uh, Skeptocrat <laughs> exclusive, we actually know the source of this strategy for Donald Trump Jr. Yeah, it turns out it was my toddler when he's on the good bouncy horse at the park and another kid wants a turn. <laughs> he operates with the exact same <laughs> philosophy. Yep. Um, <laughs> so, and, and look... As stupid as the actual strategies were, I think it's also worth marveling for a second at the idiocy that it took to communicate them through a text message. Especially when you consider Donald Trump Jr.'s habit of committing incriminating shit about his dad's election strategies to the digital record. That's what kicked <laughs> off the fucking Mueller investigation yeah. in the first place. And, no. and, and while his were obviously not alone among the unabashedly treasonous messages rolling through Mark Meadows' phone in the days following the election, they might be the most damning, right? Because, uh, I, I mean, they're, they're at least the most damning that we know about so far, because, like, as bad as Ginny Thomas's messages were, you could at least make a plausible argument that she wasn't directly coordinating with the Trump campaign. Mm -hmm. Hell of a lot harder to claim <laughs> in this instance. Yeah, not that it'll stop him from doing it, no, but no, it is no, hard. No, yeah, no nothing will. <laughs> so, a little extra detail here. According to Trump Jr.'s lawyer, November of 2020, it was a crazy time just for texting. It was a crazy yeah, texting I, moment. I, I, Everybody's just forwarding stuff. Every, you know, you're sending everything you get to everybody else you know in a text forward situation. So th the treason texting, it was probably just a forward. And, you know, retexting doesn't imply endorsement. Like, that's seriously the argument here, yes. that it was like a typical <laughs> forwarding frenzy of texting. <laughs> it didn't even that's help. why it happened. All the, yeah. And look, given that most of the strategies they were pursuing were along the lines of if we steal Nancy's little hammer, her proclamations don't count, it's easy to overlook the severity of the crime. But this is a literal coup d'etat manifesto that was sent from the president's son to the president's chief of staff, preceded by the words, quote, this is what we need to do. Please read it and please get it to everyone that needs to see it because I'm not sure we're doing it, end quote. I, I don't know that maybe that was part of the forwarded bit that his lawyer was talking about. But <laughs> what's more, there are mountains of evidence that after these messages were sent, they tried to do literally all the shit that they talked about in these fucking texts. An expert quoted in The Guardian referred to the text as smoking gun evidence of a deliberate attempt to overthrow an elected presidency that they knew was illegal. Of course, Donald Trump has long claimed a special immunity when it comes to smoking guns, so here's hoping the Justice Department isn't still playing by the Fifth Avenue rules here. Yeah. I read I read smoking rifle from a few Yeah, smoking <laughs> rifle. That was uh, Lawrence Tribe's quote, yeah. 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 Next up in headlines in not so secret service news. Two men pretending to be Department of Homeland Security officers in Washington tricked several members of the Secret Service by providing them with tens of thousands of dollars in gifts, including rent-free apartments in exchange for... We're not sure, but uh, <laughs> well, what appears to be classified information on the people the Secret Service were guarding. So, that makes sense. Yeah, not great. Not okay, great. This was way too goddamn easy to pull off the tricking the Secret Service. Like... Apparently, me and Eli could have just walked up to the Secret Service, two guys sitting there, and if we had, like, old pigtail phone wires dangling off our ear, connected to nothing, <laughs> it would have been fine, and we'd be like, hey, we're, we're going to be guarding the president now, uh, so, you know, you just tell us all the secret passwords, and then you can take the afternoon off, you're all set. <laughs> like, that would have worked. That's yep. basically what happened. If we had offered that, plus, like, a nice apartment for the night. Yeah. And and my well job, said. dear listeners, is to say, but don't though forcefully enough that it sticks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just I just enjoy our podcast while well, you still can. That's all. I'm Those saying. terms of service, dang it. So <laughs> the the two men in question, U.S. citizens Ariane Tazerda and Haidir Ali, were charged with one count of false impersonation of an officer of the United States. And according to federal prosecutors, one of them told witnesses that he had connections to the inter-service intelligence in Pakistan, and among other things offered to buy a $2,000 assault rifle for an agent assigned to Jill Biden's protective detail. Jesus. Again, federal prosecutors haven't said what they believe their motives were yet, but I, I think that's a pretty good hint. <laughs> yeah. 
We're not positive, but we do have reason to believe it's a copycat crime. So, uh, do you remember when Bugs Bunny was like, shoot him now or wait till you get home? <laughs> you think it might have been something like that. Yeah. Oh, but it gets worse. It gets worse. When the investigators searched the homes of the subjects after they arrested them, they found, quote, body armor, gas masks, zip ties, handheld radios, a drone like the ones used by SWAT teams, Homeland Security patches, 40 to 50 rounds of ammunition, weapon stocks, and documents that were stamped law enforcement sensitive, end quote. Okay, but but I have a uh, good authority from a jury in Michigan that none of that is particularly suspicious. And <laughs> Gretchen Whitmer probably had it coming anyway. Exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Joe Biden was just going to get in the car, so... Yeah. And if you're wondering how the Secret Service is handling the news that four of its agents were compromised by, among other things, a gift of a flat screen television. (laughs) Jesus Christ. Don't worry. Yep. Don't worry. Wait, wait. Don't answer yet. Yeah. (laughs) We'll throw in the flat screen. Literally. The Bowie knife. Yeah. They issued the following statement. The Secret Service adheres to the highest level of professional standards and conduct and will remain active in coordination with the Departments of Justice and Homeland Security, end quote. Not adding, what kind of television was it? Was a 4K, smart TV? Yeah, I love that they specified it was a flat screen, though, as though we were curious time travelers from 2003. Where the fuck would you find a cathode ray? Native Roku, or do I have to get my own Roku? I hate having to use up a whole HDMI port. (laughs) All right. Well, I think we could all use a little bit better protection right now. So let's toss things over to our next sponsor this week, Policy Genius. Bones. Bones on layaway. Get your bones here. Guys, what are you doing? Oh, we're uh, selling your bones on layaway. Okay, One, why? And two, you have to stop using this parking lot. The manager of this Wendy's has my cell phone. Oh, is it Leanne or Michelle? Leanne. Oh, yeah. She's very upset. Yeah, Michelle's way cooler. But my bones. Why are you selling my bones? Right, right, right. Yeah. So uh, we want to make sure your loved ones are taken care of when you die. So yeah, which includes us. And so we figure what better way to take care of ourselves than to sell your future bones on layaway. People love bones. They love bones. It's guys, true. They guys, do. you don't need to sell my bones. I got life insurance from Policy Genius. Wait, what's Policy Genius? Policy Genius is your one stop shop to find the insurance you need at the right price. How does it work? Click the link in the description or head to policygenius.com and answer a few questions. In minutes, you can compare personalized quotes from the top companies and find your lowest price. You can save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius. Their team of licensed experts are on hand through the entire process to help you understand your options and make your decision with confidence. Plus, the Policy Genius team works for you, not the insurance companies. Whether you're just starting to shop or have questions about your active policy, they're your independent advocates offering unbiased advice. Wow, and... Where could I sign up if I wanted Policy Genius? Head to policygenius.com to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. All right. I guess we don't need these then. Yeah. Okay, but where did you even get samples of my bones? Like we said, Michelle's a lot cooler than Leanne. So much cooler. What does... You you know what? Never mind. Never mind. Exactly. And we're back. Next up in headlines... We have a couple new additions to the list of Republican fears. So that's fun. On top of, of course, books without pictures, the genitalia of anthropomorphic potato toys, and the realization that you're a living fossil on its way out, we also have, we're going to add, pedophilic grooming videos disguised as Disney movies and gay cookies by Oreo. Hmm. For all the international listeners who aren't following this, I did not just make that up no, that or, wasn't or have a stroke. <laughs> yeah. the, didn't have a stroke the american right wing is currently freaking out because disney movies are lgbt sex propaganda for kids and oreo cookies don't hate gay people like cookies are supposed to mm-hmm. something like that guys if we spent an afternoon and found a good enough random word generator I bet we could get a hell of a what's next to be boycotted by Christians poll going, you know, make, maybe make an app. <laughs> yeah, remember when Kevin Swanson's homophobic Disney rants were humorous outliers instead of, you know, national policy? Yeah. Good times. Yeah. Good times. Okay, I'm going to start with the cookies. 
Oreo, in collaboration with PFLAG, released a short video last week called The Note, which tells the story of a young man going through the process of coming out as gay and dealing with certain family members and how that could be difficult. And it ends with a very simple positive message. Be a lifelong ally. And of course, conservatives responded with gay cookies. I panic now. Absolutely not. <laughs> Sackcloth, ashes. They freaked out. For example, here's the response from Newsmax host Greg Kelly. He tweeted an image of Cookie Monster and he wrote, quote, Cookie, I love cookies. C is for cookie. Cookie is for me. I do not like gay cookies. Sexuality has nothing to do with the cookie experience. Basically, cookies are asexual. Basically, they are. Tim. <laughs> Why is the woke left messing around with Oreos? Stop the insanity. And exact quote. Yeah. See, in my day, when a man started shouting that stuff, you just closed the door to his room in the old folks' home. But I guess now we put them on TV. <laughs> yeah. Like, was he tweeting that at the voices in his head? Right? Like, or, or does he think that the all caps rant about gay cookies coming for traditional marriage is the voice of reason in this situation? Yes, <laughs> I think is the answer. So Greg Kelly, after that, added his angry review of the Oreo cookie itself, writing, quote, not moist. Even Nabisco knows the truth. The cookies are too dry. Milk reliant. Not a standalone cookie. What? Go with, okay, <laughs> bananas already, but it gets even crazier than what I just said. He continues, go with the Fig Newton. We don't care about Mr. Fig's orientation, end quote. Fig Newton, he's a Fig Newton fan. Honestly, though, I cannot think of a better punishment for being a bigot than eating Fig Newtons. So this kind of seems to be a self-solving problem. Them, yeah. <laughs> oh, I love how the outside is flavorless and yet grows larger and larger by the second. Seriously, he, he complained about the moisture level of an Oreo and then he talked about a fig yes. product. Fig is like the sand fruit. What the fuck are you saying? You can stop a battle wound with a Fig Newton. <laughs> You can stop New Orleans from having a flood with fig newtons. Absolutely. Anyway, speaking of lack of moisture, Ben Shapiro also had <laughs> a strong opinion about cookies and sexuality. He tweeted, your cookie must affirm your sexual lifestyle. I think he was going for super clever sarcasm, satire there. Mm. But then again, he did make a video of himself buying one single piece of wood at Home <laughs> Depot in solidarity with their tacit approval of Republican-led voter suppression about a year ago. So uh, apparently your bigot lifestyle should be affirmed by your wood retailer, but the cookie thing is a problem for him. It, it's very confusing. But, but also, like, his side is the one demanding a cookie affirm their sexual lifestyle. <laughs> Right. Yep, exactly. right. Like no, nobody was threatening to boycott Oreos until they sponsored an LGBTQ friendly <laughs> ad. Yeah, <laughs> I I gotta say the fact that Republicans spend exactly half their time decrying cancel culture and the other exact half boycotting Canceling. people who disagree yes. with them. <laughs> it's got to be hell on that little strip of flesh between the two halves of the brain, right? It's just got it's got to be holding on by a thread. <laughs> So yeah, they, they made a culture war about fucking cookies and now they're getting dunked on. You got to love it. It's delightful. And in terms of Disney, it's actually more insane than a gay cookie panic, which is happening. The Disney thing's crazier, I would say. Conservatives are very literally accusing Disney of grooming children for sex by acknowledging the existence of the LGBT community as a thing in the world sometimes. These people think a scene w with a cartoon man and a cartoon woman kissing, that's fine. But if it's two cartoon men, for example, an adult starts fucking a child somewhere because of that. Mm -hmm. I, it's not clear, but it's something like that. They're insane. And this is all a spiteful response to Disney eventually and feebly coming out in opposition to Florida's extremely bigoted don't say gay bill. Yeah, they might as well have released a statement that says, we're exactly as pro-gay as it's safe to be at this time. Love Disney. Yeah, well, right. in, in Disney's uh, defense, they did overshoot it, apparently. But yeah, <laughs> but I, I just I love this idea that the state that continues to elect Matt Gates hates groomers. Yeah. Interesting. Fuck. 
yeah, so that that's all happening. And now we have a bunch of twitchy Republicans trying to do boycotts. That's always mm-hmm. fun to watch. Yes, it is because they're so very bad at doing boycotts. <laughs> just and you I mean, swinging and missing at a boycott. You don't have to do anything. It's a pass. Right. Thing. Yes. It's just <laughs> don't do something. And they're like, I did, but fuck, I fucked up my boycott. <laughs> just a quick review. In 2016, for example, the Kellogg's Corporation decided to cut ties with conservative outlet Breitbart News. So a bunch of right-wing idiots started dumping Kellogg's cereal down the toilet, <laughs> and, and a bunch of them clogged their toilets and got, like, shit water all over yeah, them. Yeah, they did. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> then in 2017, the Kerrig Coffee Company pulled its ads from Sean Hannity's show on Fox News. Hannity tried to get Kerrig back and get him to reconsider by giving away a bunch of their machines. But his audience was already freaking out, and people were throwing coffee machines off balconies for spite. So that one ended with a nice big purchase of Kerrig stuff. Yep. <laughs> and, of course, we had Donald Trump's angry boycott of Coca-Cola in January of last year because they didn't support voter suppression in Georgia. That lasted as many as three days before we literally saw a bottle of Diet Coke on Trump's desk. Yeah. And can I say it? I don't think he consumed any liquid in those three days, right? <laughs> that was a doctor-ordered Diet Coke, my friends. I, I think we just finally got the picture three days in. I just, I love, they're so bad at boycotting that the part where they bought Nike and Carhartt shit just so they could set it on fire on TikTok or whatever didn't even make your list. <laughs> oh. No, no. That was like their most successful boycott yeah, right there. right. Budweiser. So, <laughs> now we're seeing... Angry Republicans doing a big Disney boycott. And here's my favorite, favorite one. Here's my favorite example of that attempt. And hat tip to Pat Oswalt for making me aware of this with a tweet. Here's the chain of events for conservative commentator Dave Rubin and his boycott of Disney. It started last year, actually, when Disney Plus got rid of actor Gina Carano, who was on The Mandalorian, after she made transphobic comments online. In solidarity with her bigotry... This is what Dave Rubin tweeted on February 11th of 2021. Quote, Disney canceled Gina Carano, so I'm canceling my Disney Plus. We need to stop giving these people our money. End quote. And here's what he tweeted two weeks ago. (laughs) Just canceled Disney Plus. The only way to defeat these people is to stop playing along with them. End quote. So he, he already had a problem with Disney. He canceled their streaming service. And then he, he realized that like, Bed knobs and broomsticks are all about fucking a child because his brain is fucking reasonable. So he turned Disney Plus back on so that he could then cancel it again <laughs> two weeks ago. Really, Dave Rubin? You still still trying to win over the audience that greeted your surrogacy announcement by accusing you of being a child trafficking pedophile? <laughs> Dave, Dave, there are other ways to make money, Betty. <laughs> Wendy's is hiring, for example. Yeah. Well, Michelle's very nice. She's, <laughs> She's the coolest. And in the truth hurts news, things got somehow even worse for Trump's humiliatingly inept attempt to start his own social media site last week with the resignation of two high level executives. This is, of course, only the latest in a series of pre and post launch setbacks, including uh, but not limited to the app's unavailability for Android users, repeated outages, numerous technical problems, a weeks long waiting list to sign up for an account, a paucity of users, <laughs> investigations by both the Securities and Exchange Commission and something called the Financial Industries Regulatory Authority. And now the team that oversaw that got measurably worse. True, but thanks to one of our intrepid <laughs> listeners, Carl the Pug of Pegacorn has an account, and his only post is Donald Trump is a failed president. So, you know, <laughs> it's not all bad, is okay, what we're saying. No, yeah, there you go. So the, the two former execs in question are Chief Technology Officer Josh Adams, who has been described as the brains of one of history's least brainful operations, as well as their head of product development, Billy Boozer, who is a grown man that goes by Billy, even though his surname is Boozer. Rough. He, he sounds like he's a problematic punch-out character that was only in the Japanese version. <laughs> that they cut. Very racist against my Irish people. Yeah, exactly. 
And, and while Adams did have some legitimate success as an entrepreneur in the tech world leading up to this job, he was most recently in the news uh, after an effort to sue Alabama's Republican governor over a mask mandate got thrown out uh, of the court for being fucking dumb. But don't worry, I'm sure it'll be easy to find conservative Trump-supporting replacements in Silicon Valley. So. <laughs> okay, you know there's a few Antifa hackers walking in interviews with True Social being like, what up, fellow conservatives? <laughs> fucking slur words, right? <laughs> right? All right, let's throw some fucking apps. I am not going to sabotage you. <laughs> just, yeah. so Same you know. guys just like, oh, cool, we're keeping everyone's password on an unlocked Excel sheet on our desktop. <laughs> cool. <laughs> this is not going to take a long lunch, and I'm really no, glad because yeah, yeah. I got to get back to my real job. <laughs> We're also Secret Service. (laughs) (laughs) So with the departure of Adams and Boozer, Truth Social's remaining executive staff includes former Apprentice contestants Wes Moss and Adam Latinsky, Devin Nunes, whose social media (laughs) experience before taking over as CEO of Truth Social was limited to trying to sue a Twitter account for claiming to be his cow, even though it wasn't. (laughs) His cow doesn't even have thumbs. Uh, I'm not a cow. I'm really here. <laughs> and also, Nunes, uh, this person. who the fuck knows who else? Because literally nobody else involved with this company will allow their names to be publicly associated with it. Uh, due to a combination <laughs> of fear for future employment and hackers targeting anyone remotely associated with the site, the entire rest of the staff is anonymous. Hell, even Adams and Boozer were only known as Josh A. and Billy B. before they were outed by this Reuters report. <laughs> Okay, I'm just gonna sign up here. What? Huh? The the default avatar has a has a white hood over your face for the thing. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> I feel safe. So yeah, so these resignations came at a pretty tough moment for the struggling company. Uh, the site remains pseudo operational, and not only is it still unavailable to Android users, which, to be clear, represent like seventy one percent of all phone havers, uh, they haven't announced a date when they intend to launch for Android. In fact. As near as anyone in the media can tell, the furthest that they've gotten in that process is advertising a job opening for Android developers. Uh, And while the site did technically launch in February for iPhones users, it did so in a state that made Cyberpunk 2077 look polished. (laughs) Now, they have promised to have all those problems fixed by the end of March, but that's the past. And they haven't done it. So (laughs) instead of updating that date, the guys in charge of fixing it Quit. <laughs> yeah, not, not looking real good for the future is all. Mm-mm, no. Yeah, if you're waiting a long time for your dinner at a restaurant and then you and then you watch a bunch of people in chef jackets walk out the front door of that restaurant angrily, definitely just keep sitting there patiently. That's that's a good call. <laughs> okay. It's coming. Oh, uh, someone should tell those guys that your account comes with a matching hood. Got guys <laughs> comes with a, a hood to match those jackets. And, and look, I, I've been following this story obsessively since Trump announced last January that he was going to make his own Twitter with hookers and beers and whatever, because it was it was clearly destined for disaster from the beginning. There there was no fucking way he was going to launch a partisan app that could compete with the likes of Twitter. But the scale of the failure is beyond my wildest hopes. Hell, Truth Social has somehow managed to be a failure even by the standards set by right-wing bullshit punchline social media app alternatives to Twitter. According to data analytics firm Sensor Tower, it's getting about a fifth as many weekly downloads as Getter and barely a tenth as many as Parler. Woof. Yeah, even Gab, a right-wing social media site so infested with Nazism that it's not even allowed on Apple or Google stores, is seeing <laughs> approximately equivalent downloads and four times as much time spent on the app per visit. The, uh, like The only thing keeping Trump's site from rock bottom on that list is the fact that Mike Lindell is on it, cushioning the blow with <laughs> lumpy-ass pillows. <laughs> yeah, speaking of Mike Lindell, quick little update on him. He got served with a court complaint last week by Eric Coomer, a guy who used to work for oh, Dominion Voting Systems. The video and Lindell amazing. immediately launched into a complete meltdown rant. <laughs> he sure did. He used the phrase crimes against humanity <laughs> during that rant. <laughs> yep. And at one point, he seemed to be saying that his 2,700 employees at MyPillow would help him win a fight. Yep. Like a fit, like a rumble. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's it's fucking precious. His meltdown's amazing. Yeah. He implied that his employees would like show up to the flagpole if needed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right, right. Like all of the my pillow guys versus all the Dominion voting system guys snapping in unison as they yeah. get ever nearer. Yeah, it's amazing. 
So, when you're a Frank, you're a Frank all the way. <laughs> so yeah, much like his casinos, his charity, his university, his mattresses, his clothing line, his perfume brand, his airline, his vodka, his board game, his magazine, his football team, his eyewear company, his wall, his presidency, and his re-election campaign, Truth Social looks bound to plumb new depths of failure before dying a mortifyingly public death. And we here at The Skeptocrat promise to revel in every goddamn step along the way with you. Oh, we sure do. And finally tonight, in up to no Gouda news. Nice. Heath Enright was with me on March 28th of this year. I was. I was about to say that. Yep. Yeah. We dined at the restaurant Alphonse, Alphonse. after which we yep. went and saw the opera. We were mm-hmm. accompanied by several friends who can attest to that fact. I have Later Mouse. ticket stubs. Mm-hmm. And I mention all of that only because I know some of you are going to get ideas when I tell you that that very same night, someone stole 3,500 pounds of cheese from a <laughs> Dutch farmer in the town of Fijnart. Yeah. I guess you could say this is nacho typical crime. I mean, you can't just shove all those wheels into your pockets and, like, run away. That's <laughs> so much. There's no way the perp is going to eat them all himself, right? Eat them. <laughs> Not going to be able to eat them. Well, he's going to have to sell it on the, the jack market. So, so Lock. You, <laughs> Lock market? You can, you can tell Heath has a, a a better taste in cheese than me because the first thought in my head was something about the cops putting the squeeze on this whiz. You know, it's just right, not, yeah. it's not the same level. <laughs> yeah, so the heist of 161 wheels of cheese with a value of over $23,000 took place overnight. And there are currently no suspects, including my co-host, who again was with me all evening, Alphonse Opera, several alibis. Really but nice. apparently, crimes of this sort aren't uncommon. A similar robbery took place in the Netherlands in 2016. In 2018, there was a daring nighttime heist of 25,000 pounds of Parmesan in Italy. And even here in the United States, in 2016, someone stole 20,000 pounds of cheese from a Wisconsin farm worth over $45,000. Heath was at the opera on those days too, by the way. Yes, so, Flater we, we go all the time. Alphonse. Either way, until this case is solved, we're going to do what we do best. Let's blow the dust off and put 30 seconds on the clock for names of our upcoming cheese tice movie. Go. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, Ricotta Red Handed. <laughs> Gree Air Force One. Yes. Force One. Nice. The Fate of the Furious. Nice, nice. <laughs> uh, the Provolone Ranger. Um <laughs> Monterey Jackie Brown. Yes. Yeah, heist uh, movie. Edon in 60 seconds. Oh, <laughs> he's, he's losing it. He's losing it. Um, <laughs> mozzarella high water. Sure. Oh, all right. Uh, lock, stock, and two smoking cracker barrel. Nice. Uh, nice. The taking of Pelham 1 2 Brie. Fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good times. Good times. Did, fun dude where's my car okay on that note <laughs> we're gonna close it out thanks to no illusions thanks to eli bosnick and thanks to all the listeners who like us on facebook follow us on twitter and send us feedback on the other various internets please keep doing that please keep listening and please keep telling your friends and if you find the naive stupidity of our giving away a free show business model to be oddly charming please feel free to send us gifts of money at our donation page at patreon.com slash skeptocrat just like earl me merciman stephen green and constitutionally vogue, like in vogue, the nice funky divas, Shaza H, Jeru Shia Lee, Mike Bifulco. What is this? Yeah, name? No, who's, okay. the, who's the next one? Tamatawa Katangi Hanga Kohawatama Tiaturipuka Kapiki Nailed it. Nailed it. <laughs> Believe that is a volcano in Iceland. No. Also, <laughs> syrup slurping bastards one and two. That must be from the Great White North. Matthew Cutler, autistic Twitch streamer. Amanda, Laura Bernhagen, Nathan Hansen, and Andre Bear, whose amazing genitals are so very beautiful, nobody can resist. Try to say goodbye, and we choke. Try to walk away. We stumble, though we try to hide it. It's clear. Our world crumbles when you are not near. And whether or not you're feeling financially benevolent like those fine people may see gray. If you enjoyed our brand of whimsy and you'd like to hear more jokes I was stuck on the whole and we choke in reference to their genitals bit. I was actually going to It's it's a positive and a negative depending on the context of the situation. I was seeing you were going to work in a cheese pun, so there you go. Oh, nice. 
Macy Gray tinted. Great. Nice. <laughs> nice. Hey, on the spot, that's pretty fucking good. That's pretty good. <laughs> we have brother and sister shows. Check them out. The Scathing Atheist, God Awful Movies, D&D Minus, and Citation Needed. We had a recent D&D Minus where pretty much the whole thing was dick puns. So that was fun. Whole we thing. do cheese, dicks. We'll uh, combine them both one day. All those are available on Apple Music, Stitcher, all the other podcast apps, or the deep web. We just have one last thing. Let's compliment that penis. Special thanks to Ryan Slotnick of Evil Giraffes on Mars. He's the creator of the virtuosic musical stylings you heard today, which were used with permission. You should definitely check him out using the links we'll provide, or by Googling the only band called Evil Giraffes on Mars. Until next time, catchphrase sign off. Renus jokes. What? When we combine them, they'll be like Brenus jokes. Like penis a... and cheese. Yeah. What? What is the combo? Brenus, Bree and penis. Bree and penis. Yep. Brenus. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. Fuck. Nailed it. <laughs> the preceding podcast is a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm LLC. Copyright twenty twenty two. All.